In the last video, we introduced the concept of a space-time to visualize the way that events are connected. In this video, you'll learn how to see the slowing of clocks, the shrinking of rods, and the relativity of simultaneity as simple facts about the geometry of space-time. Hello folks, and welcome to Space, Time, and Einstein. I'm Brian Roberts. Let's return to the relativity of simultaneity. Remember the relativity of simultaneity? We gave the example of a platform moving at high speed relative to the Earth from London towards Paris. If light signals were sent from the first kisses in Paris and London at the moment they occur, then those two events are simultaneous just in case the light signals arrive at the midpoint at exactly the same instant. Now all this was a little tricky to visualize, but now we have the concept of a space-time in hand. So let's use it. Start with the two couples. We'll take a reference frame in which the two couples are both at rest, so they're each drawn as vertical lines in a space-time diagram, separated by some distance of space. Light signals are emitted the moment each event occurs, the first kiss in Paris and the first kiss in London, and they arrive at the midpoint between the two events at the same time. In fact, there are lots of events that would arrive at that same midpoint at the same time. They could start from closer distances or from distances that are further away. But if a light signal sent from a pair of events arrives at the midpoint at the same instant, then those two events happen at the same time. Now, suppose we collect together all the events that happen simultaneously according to Einstein's definition. That collection is called a hypersurface of simultaneity. It's quite a mouthful, a hypersurface of simultaneity. A hypersurface is something that's one dimension lower than the total space. So space-time is four dimensions, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. So a hypersurface for space-time is a three-dimensional space. It makes sense. All the events that happen at an instant form a three-dimensional space. Now those lovers could have had their kiss at a slightly later instant in time, and that would determine a different hypersurface of simultaneity. Each instant in time in this reference frame corresponds to a hypersurface of simultaneity. In fact, it looks exactly like the picture we made when we built up space-time using photographs. Each photograph shows a collection of events that all happened at the same time according to some observer, the observer with the camera. And when we stack those photographs up in a giant infinite stack, we're illustrating how space-time has a giant infinite stack of hypersurfaces of simultaneity. So if an observer in some reference frame judges two events to happen simultaneously in space-time, that means that the two events occur on the same hypersurface of simultaneity. If one event occurs on an earlier hypersurface of simultaneity, that observer will say it happens earlier. If it occurs on a later hypersurface of simultaneity, the observer will say that it happens later. Now, suppose a moving platform goes racing by these two couples at breakneck speeds close to the speed of light. Brian, the things you do to these couples! Nobody said love was easy. With respect to the Earth's reference frame, these two couples are at rest. And let's suppose that both of their first kisses happen simultaneously in that reference frame. We've already learned that on the moving platform, these two kisses are not simultaneous. For an observer on a platform moving from Paris towards London, the London kiss happens first. For an observer on a platform moving from London towards Paris, the Paris kiss happens first. Let's draw one edge of the platform on the left and the other edge of the platform on the right. They're moving at the same speed, so both lines are tilted to the same degree. For this observer, simultaneous events are ones that send light signals that arrive at the midpoint at the same time. When we draw these events for a moving observer, we find that the hypersurface of simultaneity is tilted. For an observer moving to the right, the hypersurface of simultaneity tilts to the right. And for an observer moving to the left, the hypersurface of simultaneity tilts to the left. This means that the moving observer judges simultaneity to be totally different than the Earth observer. The Earth observer will describe each instant in time like a giant stack of pancakes, but an observer moving to the right will have a tilted stack of pancakes, tilted up and to the right, and an observer moving to the left will have a tilted stack of pancakes up and to the left where each pancake is a hypersurface of simultaneity. Now, drawing the two events of each first kiss as a point event in space-time, we find that the observer at rest on Earth judges the two events to be simultaneous. The observer moving from London towards Paris, that is, moving to the right, 
judges the Paris event to happen first and the London event to happen second. And the observer moving the other direction judges the London event to happen first and the Paris event to happen second. These tilting hypersurfaces give us a simple way to visualize how simultaneity changes depending on how fast you're going. If an observer moves faster, tilting more from the vertical, then the hypersurface of simultaneity tilts more from the horizontal. The two sort of close into each other like an alligator mouth closing. This video is getting wild. And if the observer tilts in the other direction, the alligator mouth starts to close in the other direction. The simple rule for special relativity is that however much the observer's line tilts from the vertical, that's how much the hypersurface of simultaneity tilts from the horizontal. The angles are the same. Now it turns out that those tilting hypersurfaces make time dilation and length contraction, two very strange results in special relativity, a lot easier to visualize and understand. Let's see how these tilting hypersurfaces give rise immediately to time dilation. When two clocks are synchronized on Earth, and then one of them is placed on a spaceship and sent at extraordinary speed away from the other, an observer on Earth will judge that moving clock to have slowed. That's time dilation. Now the principle of relativity taught us that we can always use a light clock to measure time in a given reference frame. What do those light clocks look like when we draw a space-time diagram? To draw a light clock at rest, we'll draw the left side and the right side as vertical lines, and a light beam as bouncing at 45 degrees between them. In this reference frame, each bounce occurs one second after the other. The light clock ticks like a clock. Now set the other light clock in motion. Notice that to get from one side to the other, the light beam has to travel a lot farther. So it takes more time for this clock to tick from the perspective of the Earth reference frame. The faster the clock is going, the longer it takes to tick. You can now visualize why, in special relativity, time slows down. Okay, but that's just a light clock. Is that really showing time slows down? Principle of relativity. The principle of relativity then implies that all clocks slow down. We can also visualize length contraction. Remember length contraction? When two rulers have the same length when at rest on Earth, and one of the rulers is then sent at breakneck speed near the speed of light away from the other, that ruler shrinks in the direction of its motion. Let's draw the situation on a space-time diagram. The left and right ends of a ruler at rest in some reference frame correspond to vertical lines in the space-time diagram. The ruler is just the space between the two ends. My god, a thing is the space between its two ends. Now when one observer is set in motion, the principle of relativity says the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. So if the ruler were 30 centimeters at rest on Earth, a moving observer will judge it to be 30 centimeters in their spaceship. When the ruler is set in motion, let's say to the right, both its left and right ends are now moving to the right at the same speed. We draw this as two vertical lines tilted to the same degree to the right. As before, the ruler is just the space between the two ends, but now the hypersurface corresponding to that ruler is tilted. So the moving observer says that this tilted length is 30 centimeters. But for the observer on Earth, the length between those two ends is less than 30 centimeters. The ruler has gotten shorter. And the faster that ruler moves with respect to the Earth, the shorter it gets in the Earth's reference frame. That's length contraction. It follows immediately from the relativity of simultaneity viewed here as tilting hypersurfaces for moving observers. What we've just done is show how special relativity treats lengths in space and durations in time. That is, we've given a geometry to space-time. This geometry is named after the founder of the concept of space-time, Hermann Minkowski. It's called Minkowski space-time. As it turns out, this geometry is not the geometry of Euclid, hmm, but it looks a lot like points and lines. Let's see why the geometry of space-time, according to special relativity, is so different from Euclid. There's a little thought experiment that illustrates the geometry of Minkowski space-time really neatly. It's called the twin problem. It's sometimes called the twin paradox. But a paradox is a contradiction, and this is not a contradiction. It's just a fact of special relativity. So the twin problem begins with two twins, two people who were born at the same moment in time, roughly speaking. Then one year, one of the twins decides to get into a spaceship and travel at breakneck speed close to the speed of light, then turn around and come back home to Earth. Now, the spaceship twin is moving with respect to the Earth observer. So the Earth observer will judge the spaceship twin's clocks to have slowed. 
not just the ticking clocks, but the twin's pulse and all the clocks of their life. But on the other hand, the moving twin will judge the Earth observer to be moving rapidly away. And so the spaceship twin will say that the Earth observer is the one whose clocks have slowed. This looks like it could create a problem. The traveling twin goes flying out on the spaceship and comes back to Earth. But when the twins reunite on Earth, which one is older? Did the traveling twin's clock slow or did the Earth twin's clock slow? Special relativity does have an answer to this. The answer is the spaceship twin's clocks are the ones that slowed. If the traveling twin were always moving at 86.6% the speed of light, we learn that their clocks will slow to 50% of their ordinary speed. So if the Earth twin judges the traveler to be gone for eight years before their reunion, the traveling twin's clocks will have slowed so that only four years passed. Four years less aging, four years fewer heartbeats, four years less of life. When the twins reunite, the traveling twin is younger. Although these twins were born at the same time, they no longer have the same age. Why is that? What makes this possible? They were just two different reference frames, weren't they? And the laws of physics are supposed to be the same in every reference frame. Well, no, the laws of physics are the same in every inertial reference frame. And the traveling twin was not in an inertial reference frame. The reason is that traveling twin didn't just move away from the Earth, they turned around and came back again. The direction of the traveling twin changed. So it's not required that the laws of physics behave in the same way for both these reference frames. Let's think about how the hypersurfaces of simultaneity look for that traveling twin. Let's draw the spaceship moving to the right. On the journey away from the Earth, the traveling twins, hypersurfaces of simultaneity, are tilted up and to the right. But on the journey back, the hypersurfaces of simultaneity are tilted up and to the left. If you count how many hypersurfaces of simultaneity have passed, you'll find that because of the tilt, only four years for this observer have passed, whereas for the Earth observer, eight years have passed. The change in the tilting hypersurfaces explains how it is that the traveling twin experiences much less time pass than the Earth twin. Now this tells us something really interesting about geometry. Take two time-like separated events, that is, two events that can be connected by a time-like curve. The traveling twin's trajectory looks like a triangle coming off that curve. And we learned that a lot less time passes for that traveling twin. In fact, the larger the triangle, the less time passes. This means that if you start with a straight time-like line connecting two events, like the beginning of a journey and the end of a journey, all the other curvy lines connecting those two events take less time. And the curvier the event, the less time it takes. The line corresponding to the longest amount of time is the straight line connecting those two events. But wait, I thought a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. That's true in Euclidean space, but it's not true in Minkowski space-time. On a space-like curve, a straight line is the shortest distance between two events, but not on a time-like curve. What the twin problem shows is that for time-like separated events, a straight line is the longest distance between two points where distance is the duration of time that's passed. Of course, the curved lines look longer because your screen is Euclidean. The geometry of Minkowski space-time is not a Euclidean geometry, and a straight line connecting two time-like separated events is the longest possible duration between those two events. In the last video, we introduced a generalization of the notion of a straight line called a geodesic. We are going to come back to geodesics when it comes to gravity, but you can already see why it might be helpful to think a little more generally about what we mean by a straight line. Let's summarize. We've now given a geometry to Minkowski space-time. We've seen how to visualize the relativity of simultaneity in terms of tilting hypersurfaces, and time dilation in terms of the slowing behavior of a light clock, and we've seen how length contraction appears by paying attention to the hypersurfaces of simultaneity for a moving observer. In each of these cases, we've sometimes considered ever faster speeds, but never moving faster than light. And we can now start to see why that is the case. Think about what happens to the hypersurfaces of simultaneity as you tilt ever closer to the speed of light. If you could actually travel the speed of light, that hypersurface would line up with your world line. That is, time and space would become one and the same thing. This is a breakdown of the separation between time and space in the ordinary description of physics. What about time dilation? As an observer moves ever closer to the speed of light, clocks slow ever more. And if an observer could ever actually reach the speed of light, 
those clocks would slow to be frozen. They wouldn't be ticking anymore. It wouldn't be a clock. And as rulers move ever closer to the speed of light, the length of those rulers contract to be zero. A ruler at the speed of light has zero length, and a zero length thing is not a ruler. So objects that move less than the speed of light cannot be accelerated to the speed of light without a lot of things breaking down. We'll soon see another reason why things can't be accelerated to the speed of light when we introduce Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. That's all for now, folks. Stay safe, and we'll see you in space time.